laying chickens a little later. Two different kinds of breeds. One is for meat, one is for eggs. So you can imagine the ones for meat, they go a little faster. They're, uh, they're built more like me, not like an NBA basketball player. Those are the egg layers. You know, it's like beef cows, dairy cows. So, um, so uh, two, two different kinds of phenotypes for the uh, two different uh, objectives. And um, these guys are in uh, portable shelters, floorless portable shelters. It is 10 feet by 12 feet by 2 feet high. We move them every single morning to a fresh spot. We drove over the square, you can see the squares where they've been. And uh, so we, we move them every day to a new spot. So I'm going to now move one just to show you how we do it. Uh, we do this, we have this little dolly. It's a very simple little tool. And um, once we, once we uh, uh, completely eliminate all factory farming, this little tool will be available at every hardware store in America. <laughs> so. Uh, you just slip it under the back end. That's just enough to break ground contact. Go to the other end. And the birds just walk to the next spot. Okay, they just walk to the next spot. I'm not going to move it all the way, but you get the idea. And that move takes 60 seconds. So every day, every day the birds get a brand new salad bar, they get new new bedding and linen. They're not potty trained, you know. And uh, so one person at every 60 seconds can move one of these shelters. So one person with that little tool, that little dolly, no petroleum, no machinery, no engines, can move 4,500 chickens in 60 minutes. And the shelter protects them from predators, protects them from weather. To my knowledge, we've never had a single bird taken by hawks in 50 years. So we call these chicken shelters. We used to call them chicken pens, which of course is a lot easier to say, but then we started showing up on animal rights uh, brochures as uh, hypocrites because we were putting them in a penitentiary. We, we were thinking of a, like a place there, like for children, you know, you can put little children in a skewer and they can play. But anyway, um, so now we call them shelters to try to get away from all that stigma of pen, like penitentiary. Um, so it's, it's a bummer because it's a two syllable word than a one syllable, so it takes twice as long to say it. It's a real bummer. But anyway, chicken shelters. 75 in each shelter. Um, let's go over uh, a kind of a big picture thing. The average American farmer is now 60 years old. So if you study uh, ag economics and, and that sort of thing, the, 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 the data points in the next 15, that's five, 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 15 years, 50, 5 50% .0, of all America's agriculture equity is going to change hands. That has never happened in any civilization except in conquest. You know, the Huns override Rome or whatever. Now, I'm not saying we're getting ready to have a conquest. <laughs> maybe we are, maybe we are, I don't know. But all I'm saying is this is unprecedented in the history of civilization to have that great a degree of agrarian equity transfer that fast. Obviously, we desperately need young people to come into farming. 
but there are some really big hurdles for young people coming into farming, at least in the orthodox uh, thinking. Okay? What's the single biggest hurdle? Land. Land. Right. Uh, you know, when mom and dad bought this farm when I was four in 1961, so if you're quick at math, you know how old I am. 61 bought this farm, it was 90 bucks an acre, $90 an acre, and it would produce $90 worth of feeder calves a year per acre. So the production and market price were one to one. You with me? Today, it's 7,000 an acre. All those calves have gone up to, uh, to 350. That's really nice. But instead of a one to one, it's now a 20 to one, okay? You've heard the little business, uh, the little business uh, book, Who Moved My Cheese? All right, that's called moving your cheese, okay? When you go from a one-to-one -one ratio to a 20-to-one 20 ratio. Which means that what Grandpa did doesn't work anymore. You know, I mean, I remember growing up here in the old timers around talking about, yeah, I, I bought that 100 acres over there, you know, back in the 52. I think it was... Uh, I think it was about $10,000, and we, uh, we put a little crop of wheat on a few acres, we grew some calves, had a few sheep, and you know, we paid for that 100 acres in two years of what we produced on that place. Now, I've heard that ever since I've grown up. Today, that's not, our, that's not our new context. So, here's what I want you to think about. As you look at this in that context, I want you to think about, first of all, the infrastructure here is mobile. The mobility allows us to separate the farm enterprise from the land. We have these on piece places that we rent. You can put this on bar land, city park, backyard, put three urban, uh, suburban backyards together and, 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 and do this. Uh, the, the, the medians of the interstate, uh, uh, land conservation land, whatever, orchards. Um, there's, you can put this anywhere and it's completely mobile so you can separate the land cost from the farm enterprise. That's a big deal, okay? That's a big deal. And the neat thing about mobile infrastructure is the government doesn't know what to call it. It's not a building, so there's no licensing. It's not a machine, so there's no, no depreciation of property tax. It's a nothing. And I like farming where all my equity is nothing. <laughs> okay? All right, so mobile. Number two, modular. Not that anybody here would ever want to raise chickens for Tyson, but if you did, you want to raise chicken, a chicken for Tyson, what's the first thing you have to do? Build a barn. A cheap barn? No. no. A really expensive barn, like half a million dollars. Okay? Uh, I even call that kind of elitist. I like to use that term because that's what they call me. You got these expensive elitist chickens, you know. And I say, if I got to borrow half a million dollars to join your fraternity, I'll call that a little bit of elitist too, right? So, um, I got about a $500,000 uh, uh, structure to to grow one chicken. Here, all you got to do is cancel your uh, net Netflix subscription for a couple months, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, a couple months you don't have to keep up with the Kardashians on the front page of People magazine, and a few pennies, and you can build one of these for a couple hundred bucks. And if you like it, you can build another one with your retained earnings. And if you like it even more, you can build a third one. And if you're completely uh, 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 apoplectic like us, you can build 200 of them. But it allows you to start embryonically with pocket change and scale with cash flow rather than borrowed money. Dave Ramsey would be proud, <laughs> okay? So, so the, the modular allows you to grow with additional modules rather than putting all that capital cost and debt structure up front to start one chicken. Does that make sense? All right, the third M, there's gonna be three M's here. First one's mobile, next one's modular, 
The third one is management intensive. Management intensive. Of course, that's where the naysayers say, I, I knew there was a catch here. And they say it was a little bit of a, a kind of a curled lip, derisive, condescending attitude like, I can't imagine something worse for our sophisticated techno glitzy culture than to have more farm. Well, I don't apologize for it. I think we need more farmers. I think we'd be a lot better off with more farmers. And so we have strategically chosen to substitute energy intensity, capital intensity, and pharmaceutical intensity with people. I think that's a good trade-off. What that means is that our equity, instead of being physical stuff, our equity is personal ability. So our equity is in knowledge, skill, and customers. And I've never met a banker yet that said, I'm going to come and foreclose on your knowledge. <laughs> or I'm going to repossess your skill. Okay? So by investing in people with non-physical equity, it gives us an ability to have resilience in a very uh, uh, you know, epochal-changing time. And we are in epochal-changing times. Okay? Um, so, mobile, modular, management intensive, and that gives a way for young people to get in because they don't have to buy the land or capitalize everything, and you can do it on leased land, barred land. We know all sorts of collaborations. I mean, we've worked with neighbors around here where we put these things on. We don't pay any rent at all. Sure, I'm, uh, all it does is put out more fertilizer, grow more grass. What guy doesn't want, you know, uh, this, uh, we, we'll even, I, I'll tell you what, I'll fertilize your pasture, you don't have to pay me for it. How's that, you know? And so it allows for real win-win collaborations and for young people to be able to get in at, 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 uh, at, at a lot easier. Questions? Yes? Chickens for playpen? Chickens, chickens for playpen, uh, 75. We start with 75 and we probably harvest about 70. A bit of a you know, they all they don't all make it. Yeah. I read uh, you had written that you're bumping up against your twenty thousand limit. Yeah. Um, have you any hope of changing that situation? Um, we don't have any hope of changing that situation. The question is, um, what what can be done legally within that within that context to either make a run around it or to uh, whatever, go through it. And so this year, we are having about 20,000 chickens processed for us at a little federal inspected facility in Manita, Virginia, 90 miles away. So twice a week, twice a week. You live there, all right? You know Eco-Friendly Foods in Manita? Bev, Bev Eggleston? If you, if you ever met him, you'll never forget him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, eco-friendly food in Manita, Virginia. It's a little, it's a little tiny, tiny uh, facility. He's been in business for, I don't know, uh, 12, 15 years. And um, so we're taking, we're taking 20,000 down there to allow us to move on up to about 40 or 45,000 uh, this year. Uh, I just I just went through Massachusetts and Vermont uh, three weeks ago looking at uh, there's a guy who is building uh, literal little um, federal inspected modules mobile modular management intensive using uh, shipping containers refabbing them and uh, and you get this this eight foot by 48 foot uh, prefab mobile module dropped on your place on four pillars no it's not it's not a building there's no inspection federal inspected processing facility for chicken it's called plant plant in a box p-i-b plant in a box so his his blog his blog is thinking inside the box <laughs> um so you know so we've, we've looked at that as well and um and we've also gotten clearance it looks like that um that we can also collaborate with somebody here 
and sell them under our Polyface umbrella, <laughs> under our brand, them as an independent grower. That was a kind of a big breakthrough. So they could process them on their place and, and we can sell them collaboratively. Um, so there are, there are several mechanisms here and uh, we may use one or two or all of them. We, we don't know. We don't know where it's going to go. Thank you. But thanks for the question. Yeah. What up? Yes, ma'am. How long does it take for the pot to regenerate? Well, it, it all depends on, of course, season and, uh, and especially rainfall. So this is a six month on, six month off pro process. So the first birds come out into the field. They come out at three weeks. The, the, the brooder is down at the house there. They come out at, at between two and three weeks. Um, in fact, we went by some real, real little ones there as we first uh, came in. You might have seen them there. Mm -hmm. They come out real small and they're out here for five weeks. So uh, we can run about eight or nine batches in a season. Mm -hmm. We start a new batch every three weeks a new batch and um, so we start the first ones come out in the spring uh, in you know late March early April and the last ones will be gone by the middle of October okay so it's a six month on six month off because this is not very good for them to be out here in the snow and winter and cold and everything like that so we do it seasonally one of the reasons that we're irrigating and by the way this um, uh, you'll see several irrigation modules running. Um, this is a New Zealand irrigation. It's called K-Line. K stands for Kiwi. Uh, New Zealand. Developed in New Zealand for Grazier. And um, it's a very simple modular um, system. And we've got four of them running right now. We're not pumping out of any aquifer or any creek or river. Okay? We don't believe in pumping out of aquifers or creeks or rivers. This water is impounded uh, snow melt and rain event surface runoff captured back in the winter, okay? So we have these ponds, we have numerous ponds we've built around so we can impound millions of gallons of water. By definition, when the surface, when the surface is running off, when the water is running off the surface, by definition, the commons is full, the cup of the commons is full. Okay, and so that's what creates flood downstream. So if we can hold the surface runoff, when finally everything's saturated and the surface runoff happens, if we can hold that back in ponds, then we protect, we protect people downstream from flooding and we offer the soil the, 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 the joy of a drink, the rejuvenation of a drink in a dry time. And so we developed, we, we got into the, uh, the irrigation primarily to be able to make sure we can dump water behind these shelters to capture all the nitrogen and, and, and fertility coming from the chickens so it didn't vaporize in a, in a, in a heat uh, dry time, okay? And, um, and we like it so well, we, we now use it uh, all over the place. We've been, we've been gradually building ponds for, you know, forever, and um, we finally have enough storage now that we can actually I get a lot, get a lot covered, so it makes a big difference in, in a in a dry time. Uh, it's a perfect example of, of trying to um, use your resources more strategically. Um, often on a farm, if there's a child that wants to stay on the farm, the family grows up coveting the neighbor's land because the only way to expand is to, to get more land to you know expand horizontally. And so, you know, you just grow up hoping the neighbor's dad dies before your own dad. You know, that's kind of the way. Well, that's not a real friendly way to grow up, you know. And so this irrigation allows us to, to tremendously ramp up production using resources we already have that used to be lost and be flood problematic downstream and use those strategically for the benefit of everybody up here, including increasing the volume that we have here. We think we haven't even scratched the surface yet on productive capacity. Um, so, so the idea is how do we how do we tease how do we tease better leverage out of the resource we have rather than uh, rather than you know, necessarily expanding the land base. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Variety of royals. 
Uh, these are Cornish Cross, same uh, same genetics as Tyson, Purdue, Pilgrim's Pride. Now I'm waiting for the follow-up question for that. He's going to ask it. <laughs> Where are the heritage breeds? We're not picky. Oh, you're not picky? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, let me explain why we use traditional genetics here. I'm not going to argue whether heritage breeds are better, worse, or anything else. Okay, but our goal here, one of our goals, is to offer a credible alternative to factory farming, period. We don't want to see any factory farming in the world. There's no reason for it. There's no excuse for it. It shouldn't happen. Well, we're not going to do that with a dark meat, razor-breasted, $40, three-pound chicken. Okay? And in marketing, in marketing, you can only be so weird. My uh, mentor, Alan Nation, founder of Thoughtman Grass Farmer, used to have a little ditty. He said, in marketing, uh, you, can, uh, you can be a nudist or you can be a Buddhist. But you can't be a nudist Buddhist. It's just too weird. Nobody will believe you. Okay? And that's a little bit where we are here. We're telling people, don't buy your chicken at Walmart. Don't buy your chicken pre-cooked and pre-breaded. Take it home and cook it, okay? That's weird enough. When you say not only that, but you want a razor-breasted, all-dark meat, tough bird that you can't fast cook, suddenly you just become a nudist Buddhist, okay? And so, and so, uh, I won't debate. I won't debate which one's better or worse, but I'll debate till the cows come home which one creates a credible penetration to dislocate in the marketplace to dislocate the unsavory elements of factory farming okay and so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll that's where I'm gonna put my flag okay and so right now we offer this bird we offer a heritage rooster that we have ourselves and then we offer the stewing hen which is an old hen that's been laying and is now done with her productive life and we offer those as well. So we offer the three kinds of birds and most recently this kind GMO, uh, uh, not GMO free, um, uh, soy, soybean free, okay? So now we offer this bird both with uh, uh, regular and soybean free. And that's an experiment, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, it, has to, it has to do a certain amount inside the inventory. Um, maybe one more question and we'll go. Yeah. Are the factory farmers doing anything to undermine your efforts? Lobbying are, or politically? Or yeah, are factory farmers doing anything to undermine our efforts? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, in general terms, no. I, I mean, you know, it's not like we get hate mail or, you know, specific questions. But what they do do is uh, they are in, uh, you ever heard the word collusion? They're in collusion with the... Uh, <laughs> just recently. Just recently, yeah. yeah. <laughs> New words. Um, they're in collusion with the government uh, bureaucrats, regulators. And so they, so I'm going to give you an example. Like right now, if avian influenza, you know, we've had avian influenza hit different parts of the country different times. If avian influenza came to our part of, of the world right now, already the legislation, I mean, it's already, caught, it doesn't have to be voted on. I mean, it's, it's part of the regulation. Part of the response plan is to immediately make illegal any outdoor chicken. Okay? Now, in the one of the uh, two avian influenza outbreaks back, the one that hit Europe and came across, um, you know, came across Turkey and, and Pakistan. There, Great Britain did a bunch of research, and they found that if a, if a chicken gets two blades of fresh grass a day, two blades of fresh grass, she'll never get high path avian influenza. Now you would think that the industry, if they really cared about anything, would say, well, that, that's, a, that's an easy fix. You know, we'll just, we'll just do that. 
no, that was, you know, dismissed and all that. And so, um, so while we don't get any, you know, outright day-to-day -day hostility, the, the, the orthodox system, the, the fraternal orthodox system is extremely prejudiced against this kind of thing because they, they really believe that our unvaccinated, unmedicated chickens have to be sick because we all know wellness comes out of a bottle. And the red-winged blackbird and the, and the indigo bunting that flit around here and might happen to land on a, on a shelter and commiserate with the chicken are going to take our diseases to the Tyson environmentally, scientifically controlled chicken houses and all those chickens are going to get sick and all the children in Bangladesh are going to die because they can't get American chickens. I mean, that's the, that's the paradigm under which they are. So there's not a day-to-day -day outright hostility, but there's this, this undercurrent of, of, of orthodoxy um, that considers us heretics, okay? And, uh, and, and so that's, that's where we are. Now, if that happened, we would tell them these are not outdoor chickens. These are completely confined. That, 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 yeah, that would be our, yeah, that, that would be our argument, okay? So it's not like we haven't thought about it and prepared a little bit. And it's not like we haven't ever tangled with them either, okay? I have a whole book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. If you want to see some of the tangles, you can uh, read the stories in there. Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. So, okay, good. We're going to have to run. We're going to go now to the uh, cabin chair. Don't better run. Mm -hmm.